Hi, my name is uh, Jeff Wentworth. I'm the co-founder of CurveGrid. We're a blockchain middleware company uh, based in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, super excited to be here at Reimagine and looking forward to the, the conference. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Reimagine 2021. This is our eighth conference in a monthly series of events, bringing you nothing but the best projects, bright minds, and leaders in the space. We've been fortunate enough to invite many talented individuals and teams to come speak with us, providing updates, insights, and all the above that's happening in crypto. Um, I'll be your host today, Adam, from the Mousebell team, where we focus on early stage uh, investments through our accelerator uh, or providing development support to a number of growing projects, as well as education within uh, our Mousebell University program. Our main objective is pretty simple. Our goals are to increase adoption, use cases, and real world applications. We seek to educate our, our audience on blockchain by helping them understand crypto's real impact. Um, again, thank you all for joining uh, with us today. We have an exciting interview for, uh, for you today. And let me go ahead and introduce you to Jeff Wentworth, uh, CEO of CurveGrid. How are you doing, Jeff? I'm good. How are you doing, Adam? Cool, man. Thanks for taking time out of your day to, to participate. Um, you know, I look forward to the, this discussion. I feel like CurveGrid is super important, really critical to kind of adoption from a developer standpoint, from a, from a user standpoint, from just kind of an expansion in the industry. So without further ado, let's kind of get into it. Um, tell us your story. You know, we've had everybody on this uh, the, through this conference. And, and one of the cool things is that everybody has their own rabbit hole story. Everybody's got into blockchain, you know, one way or another uh dating back to 2010 you know 2008 2010 2013 i don't even know but what were you doing before blockchain and what led you to kind of blockchain crypto yeah yeah sure so uh, we, we could talk a, a, about curve grid a little bit more but first of all you know as i mentioned i'm based in tokyo japan i've been out here for about 15 years originally grew up in toronto canada and before blockchain i was working uh for a large it company um in in sales engineering uh and then uh in uh for, for uh, an investment bank uh, in product engineering and, you know, was aware of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, but, but didn't really pay much attention actually until 2016 uh, when I read about Ethereum and the original DAO, right? The original DAO, like the DAO, which uh, was just fantastical to me. Like the idea that, you know, you could essentially uh, take uh, uh, capital from you know essentially create a decentralized venture capital fund which it's not only had the capital the money but also the governance and the voting and that was my aha moment that was like okay yeah i get i get the the opportunity here of course you know uh it it, it failed i mean you know if uh, um i mean ether was at like ten dollars at the time right so probably yeah, yeah. one of the biggest hacks in history you know which caused as we all remember the the ethereum ethereum classic fork um, but I was, I was like, okay, I get it. Like, I see the potential of this. And so, um, yeah, you know, my, uh, um, uh, uh, very, uh, good friend, dear friend, uh, and, and, uh, former coworker, William and myself, uh, started curve grid about a year later in 2017. And we had a whole list of ideas and our ideas were, uh, you know, uh, I mean, everything, I mean, everything It was, you know, 50 things long. We picked one close to the top of the list that we thought was achievable. In the blockchain space, which was um, um, a decentralized warehouse management system, so you're managing inventory on the blockchain, like each item in a warehouse—a T-shirt or, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, whatever boxes of, of um, uh, trinkets—is is an is either a smart contract or an item in a smart contract. We started building that, and um, uh, you know, within a few weeks. Uh, realized that we were spending all of our time building the infrastructure. We we're building all of the pieces to support that rather than building the DAP itself because the, um, the kind of developer ecosystem, because the infrastructure e ecosystem was in such an early stage. We thought, well, if we're having this problem, everybody's having this problem. So that, that became our product, this multi bass blockchain middleware. And we've been, been building and, and, and selling it and working with our partners and customers ever since. So did you see kind of... Uh... So you saw the technology for what it was, and then you also saw Bitcoin too. Like, did those two come together at the same time? Because, you know, everybody's story is different, right? Like, so, 
Yeah. Some people, I came across Bitcoin in 2013 and it didn't ring a bell, but I was at the bank at that point. And, and uh, I've been in blockchain now, like for, for a few years, but at that point, like somebody was buying Bitcoin and tried to look it up and, you know, and then I went to grad school and then people were like, Oh, Ethereum and, and, and XRP at that mm-hmm. time. And like, you know, mm-hmm. tr- trying to understand it, but your aha moment, like coming from the tech side, I guess, um, it just all made sense to you, obviously, right? Because a lot of people, it took them a couple of tries, but um, like what, aside from that aha moment, was anybody else kind of the other developers, programmers that you knew, were they also talking about how this technology was going to kind of re- revolutionize? Mm. You know, I, I think people either get it or they don't, right? Yeah. It's sort of like, if you've ever taken like a, an introduction to economics course, you know, which I did in, in university and, and, I'm still only really at the introductory level, you know, there's that, that time when either, you know, in an intro econ course, or you figure out at some point in your life, the aha moment of like fiat currency is, is completely based on the belief that that currency will be, uh, um, you know, will have value. Like yeah. we have this collective social compact that, uh, you know, the U S dollar or the Japanese yen or the Euro uh, is going to have value, right. That, we believe in the economic system and the, the system of government that, yeah. you know, will, 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 will kind of have that value. And I think, you know, it, it took me a while to sort of apply that also to cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. And I realized, okay, they've now, you know, at some point it, it, there's enough weight behind it that it's gone from being kind of this hobby project, which I think it was for many years, right. To something that actually people trust in because the, the system, the technology underlining it, uh, you know, underlying it has proven itself enough. So I think that's that's the second piece there that that uh, you know there's a there's a, a naming or nomenclature confusion, right? We've got the Bitcoin blockchain, and then we have the Bitcoin cryptocurrency, and they're named the same thing, right? Uh, but the Bitcoin is sort of Bitcoin is sort of the killer app for the Bitcoin blockchain, and uh, you know, smart contracts, if you will, are the killer app for the Ethereum blockchain, and. Um, you know, it, it yeah, it, it it definitely took me a while to kind of figure that out. And you know, at our at our company, um, something that we do is we tend not to hire um, uh, blockchain engineers because they're they're like you know these these magical unicorns that are very difficult to find on the open market, as I'm sure you know you you know from some of your your activities with Mouse Belt. But uh, we tend to hire just very good software engineers and then train them, right? Because um, uh, you know it's the the not only is it is it such a new field, and of course there's the I'd say the demand outstrips the, the strips the supply, but it's changing so quickly, and so you know as but you know people have that aha moment, and then there's it like opens up this whole other swath of things to learn and get into and go deep on in terms of blockchain and cryptocurrency. And I've been at this four years or five years, I guess, and you know every single day I'm learning something new, which is something that's exciting about the space. And, and let's touch on a couple of those things there because yeah, we have an engineering team, very difficult. The opportunity that we saw like four years ago as well was mm-hmm. like, Hey, there's a shortage of, of developer talent, like obviously around crypto blockchain and, and how, you know, you know, how to, how to architect and design it and, and apply it. Um, and we have students right now, we have individuals that are looking to get it, get into blockchain and, and, I'll focus on the developer side uh, because of what you're doing, what your company's doing, like where sure. you come from. Sure. Um, but but even for everybody watching, right? The, the blockchain touches many disciplines, like like you said, you know, some business, uh, marketing, uh, psychology, right? Like all mm-hmm. these illegal, mm-hmm. right? Is probably blowing up right now off of off of blockchain. Yeah. But we'll keep it de- developer focused, and you know. It's interesting you say that you're looking, which is great because I want the audience to know that you don't have to be a specialist, right? Um, to kind of apply, to get into blockchain. If you want to be a coder, you want to be a programmer, you want to start building things. So talk about kind of your experience with your partner, um, not not building a blockchain, but being like a web 2.0 dev, like understanding that landscape and then going into blockchain. What were some of the nuances or like, you know, mm-hmm. what was that journey like? Because we have people right mm-hmm. now that are like, you know, coming from Web 2.0 and they're, they're not blockchain specialists or developers. And there's actually a mm-hmm. lot of teams right now that are trying to streamline this. And we'll get into Curve Grid shortly about mm-hmm. like the solutions you provide, kind of the benefits you provide to, to, to the users and, and, and clients. But what, what, what were you thinking or like what was the process going from like, you know, this traditional development work to now into blockchain? 
Yeah. Yeah. I come from a computer engineering background, which means at school, I studied both hardware and software. And I sort of liken the, um, the, the journey into blockchain from, from web 2.0 development to kind of like the journey into hardware engineering for, as a software engineer, you know, um, you, you start to play around with, with hardware. And I mean, it, you know, at the low level, it could be plugging resistors into a board or, you know, if you've ever done, if anybody's ever done any FPGA, like field programmable gate array development, you, you basically are, you know, making hardware, but you're not drawing, you know, diagrams in CAD, you're writing code, which then gets generated into, into hardware. And uh, um, there's two primary programming languages there. One is called Verilog and another one's called VHDL. And especially Verilog looks a lot like the C programming language. You think, oh, I know C, I'm a computer, I'm a software engineer. Like this is gonna be easy. I can make this hardware stuff. And immediately you figure out that everything works different in hardware land because you're dealing with like practical issues of timing and you're dealing with everything happening in parallel. And, and all of these sorts of concepts that there's no, you know, there's kind of an analog to your software engineering background, but not really, it's completely different. And I think that's sort of the, again, the analog to um, uh, smart contract development or blockchain, like oh, Solidity, this looks like a C programming language. It's so easy, I'll pick the, yeah, I know JavaScript, no problem, right? But, um, you know, even though the, the smart contract programming kind of looks like, you know, you, you're going back to the 1980s or 1990s or something like that and just programming in C, the, the concepts uh, are, are very, very different. And uh, a, lo a lot of it has to do with the fact that you, you all of a sudden really, really, really need to care about everything that's happening behind the code because the blockchain, you know, the power of it is it's giving you all of this infrastructure to run your smart contract on, um, but it's also operating in a way that is very different from a standard um, you know, uh, um, a programming environment, right? Like you run something on the blockchain and you're essentially running it on a public shared, uh, you know, computer that everybody in the world has access to and, you know, is not necessarily incentivized to, uh, to be good or be good, you know, to align their interests with you, right? They may try and hack your code or they may not, or, um, you know, you, you, your transactions may get bumped because you're not paying high enough gas fee and et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's an eventually consistent, it, it relies on this eventual consistency model. And so all of these concepts are, are uh, you know, just, just so kind of mind blowing and mind expanding. And, you know, it's interesting to, to see people, you know, you do like an introduction to Solidity tutorial or something, and you're working on Remix, which is an online, like, you know, IDE and online programming environment. You think, oh, okay, yeah, this I got this, I got the hang of this. And then you go to deploy it on like the Rinkeby test network and you're like, where is my transaction? How come it didn't happen? Now, where is it in Etherscan or what, Not you know? Right. And and um, um, and then you try building a UI on top of that. You try building an exchange, you try building a blockchain based game. And so I think that um, that's a real challenge, but I think for a lot of people, uh, a lot of software engineers, it's like, oh, it's something new. It's something totally new. And that's what makes it exciting because there's yeah. so much depth and breadth there and really, you know, whatever we are 12 years on from Bitcoin and, and five, six years from Ethereum, we're still in the early days of it. It's like the internet in the 1990s where uh, we've got decades and decades ahead of us before this becomes, you know, be before everything just sort of gets commoditized away. So I think, I think that's the journey that I was on. I think that's the journey we see a lot of our software engineers go on. And I think that's what in, what's interesting out there for the broader software development community. And, and so you and your partner, it, because we've thought about like kind of this, this middle, you know, this middle layer that this operating layer where, you know, how do you build on blockchain? How do you create and focus on dApps rather than, like you said, um, you guys were focused on so much infrastructure and I don't think we've had too many teams on I, very, actually none. I know of a couple pro, you know, like projects that are, that are trying to streamline, for people to, to just focus on building rather than kind of the infrastructure stuff. And it's all timing and maturity, right? This thing is mm -hmm. taking some time and then you're, you're going through, you went through those growing pains. Um, and so for those watching, you're kind of explaining, right? Like, like what's been happening? Why are things maybe taking time? Why is it so difficult? Um, because mentally I feel the, it, maybe us in the bubble, 
are like, you know, why isn't this working? Like what's taking so long? It's just like mm-hmm. a process. I feel mm-hmm. like we're here mentally. We can like accept and, and we're, we're prepared for the future, but technically we're, 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 we're grinding it out. So with your partner, you, you said you started trying to do this, uh, this inventory warehouse thing, and then you realize you're just building like infrastructure. So what, what, tell, tell, so tell me like what happened there? Like you you and your boy are like, all right, man, like we got to pivot here and like, we got to focus on some other avenues for ourselves. Do we turn it into a business? What, what's the thought process? Yeah, no, we, we'd already, I mean, we had the, we had the business idea at that point. And actually um, it's interesting because we were like two weeks into Curve Grid in, in May, 2017. And we went to consensus SYS, the conference, wait, SUS. It's confusing. There's two of them. SUS uh, in New York, uh, like just to say, like, let's, let's see what, what, what's going on. Right. And that was, that was May, 2017. So, you know, we're in like the DeFi boom right now. That was like the start of the ICO boom, like at that conference EOS launched, yep, yep, for example, yep, yep. right. I mean, you know, way, way back in the day. And, um, and we, we arrived, we, um, we joined a hackathon at the last minute and ended up winning sort of like the prize for, uh, you know, you need help, <laughs> like not not even most improved, but you need some help prize. And, and actually that was from Consensus SYS. And that the, the prize that we won was sort of entrance, in, entrance into Consensus Academy, like the first one. Um, and, and um, you know, that that's where, that, that hackathon is what allowed us to sort of try out this warehouse manager system. And, and we got nowhere, like we didn't even, you know, at the time, I don't even know if Truffle existed at the time. I mean, certainly not hard hat or any of these other tools that we kind of take for granted today, but, you know, you were, you were programming to basically the, the core like Geth node and we couldn't even, you know, get that up and running. And, um, um, you know, what we, what we sort of took away from that experience and then coming back to Japan in the weeks after that and going through Consensus Academy was that, um, uh, you know, well, first of all, to answer your question, we, we had, we knew we were doing something, but we didn't know what yet. So we, we were sort of still in discovery mode. Uh, number two, um, what it really felt like for us and for everybody that we talked to was even, I said early 1990s before, it was almost like the 1970s, 1980s, where somebody, somebody had come and said, look, I want you to make, I want you to make a, a program to win, manage my where, warehouse inventory. I want you to make a program to, that's, a, that's a game that's running on the blockchain because I have these ideas around incentives or whatever, right? Um, and as the programming team would go, great. The first thing we're going to need is this thing that stores data that allows us to access it. Oh, you mean a database? Yeah, a database. But like, there is no Oracle. There's no Microsoft SQL. There's no Postgres or MySQL. So the first thing you do is you basically go and build a database from scratch, and that's kind of what it feels like, right? Like even even today, you know, we've got we've got building blocks like the Open Zeppelin libraries. Uh, we didn't have those at the time, number one. But even today, they're still very very low level. You know, you're plugging together these very low level constructs to get kind of one layer up and one layer up and one layer up. And, and um, uh, you know, so in terms of the, the, like the, the, the kind of the stack, if you will, right? Stack being at the lowest level is the blockchain itself. And above that, we have node providers like an Infura or Alchemy or whoever. And above that, we've got, um, you know, maybe, maybe libraries like Open Zeppelin. And above that, we've got um, things that connect to our off-chain systems. Like I, I want to build a web UI or for my exchange, or I want to build a, you know, want to plug into my my mobile game. None of that connection really existed, and it still it, it still doesn't exist very much. And that's the space where CurveGrid plays, and that's where our our our, our uh, middleware software uh, focuses on, right? And and it's really that layer that that came out of our experience with the warehouse management system, our experience building other projects for customers, uh, that that we've just been expanding kind of the capabilities of that. Uh, and the idea is that. You can come in with a minimal of uh, blockchain expertise. Maybe, maybe, maybe you have smart contracts, or you're you're using some open smart smart contracts, or you know we help you with the smart contracts. And then all the rest of your devs are non-blockchain engineers, and they can be up and running and immediately productive, building your blockchain-based game, or your exchange, or your dashboard for your DeFi protocol, or whatever. Um, and and that's really um, you know where we've we saw the the opportunity and the need and kind of where we're, we're focused as well to make it easy for people. And so, so what does uh, Curve Grid offer? What kind yeah. of solutions, the platform solutions, um, you know, who are your target like profiles and, and who's leveraging kind of this solution? Because 
going back to kind of the the intro, just kind of you know adoption. Um, what can we do to get people to uh, increase pilots, POCs, experimentation, right? Instead yeah. of always, like you said, building from scratch, fatiguing, taking time, costly. Um, so yeah. yeah, well, what are some of the uh, the solutions that that Curve Grid provides, and um, who you know who do you work with? I guess at a high level, like what are your clients, customers, or enterprises, yeah. startups? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, um, um, yeah, our whole mission is to make it fast, easy, and cost-effective for you know organizations, companies, uh, you know, software development teams to build on top of the blockchain and not having to to necessarily know all of the details about blockchain. It, and the analogy, again, going back to a database is you're a software engineer, you can write SQL, right? Or use an, a, a library, a database library, but like you don't want to care how the database is putting the bits and bytes onto disk, right? Or when a database crashes, like you just want it to come back up again. And so that's the, that's the layer in between that we're providing, right? So the first thing that we do at a very practical level is for any, any smart contract, we, dyna- we, we dynamically build a secure permissioned REST API. So very fam- you know, familiar REST API that any software engineer can use uh, without having to know anything about the underlying details of the blockchain. And you know, one key piece there is that if you look at Ethereum, right? we just had the, Bar- the Berlin hard fork a few weeks ago, there's constant updates to Ethereum. Things are changing subtly. And if as a software engineer, if you're not keeping up with that, right, the DAP that you released last month might not run next month because they've changed something, right? And so our REST API, we're giving you, not only are we giving you this dynamic REST API to to call the smart contract functions, both read and write, we're also giving you a very stable platform to build against. So we're the ones that are tracking the releases from Ethereum, tracking the releases from XDAI or Binance Smart Chain or OMG Network or any of the other blockchain platforms that we support. And you're always gonna get the same interface, right? So as a software engineer, that's great. I can focus on just building my application, number one. Number two, we help you plug into um, off-chain systems, right? So, you know, for example, one of our solutions is um, a spreadsheet plugin for the blockchain. So you can query blockchain smart contracts, read, write in real time. Uh, um, uh, you know, so so some of our, uh, one of our customers is, is uh, one of our partners is Ave, right? So they're, 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 you know, using our spreadsheet plugin to help manage their, um, um, their, their, their protocol. And, you know, what I think the advantage they, they like, you know, one of the, the values there for, for our customers and partners is even going beyond a REST API, if you can use a spreadsheet, now you can talk to the blockchain. So that opens it up, you know, not to the 5,000 so- blockchain software engineers out there, not to the, the 25 million software engineers in the world, but the 1 billion spreadsheet users. <laughs> yeah. And so when we talk about connecting to off-chain systems yeah that's the, that's kind of the second really really key piece and the third piece is uh we're, we're providing uh, sort of extra value in terms of um you know other pieces that make it easy to build on the blockchain so we connect uh to to enterprise wallets hardware security modules allow you to sign transactions and do transaction automation we provide something that's kind of very similar to the graph which is um we call it event queries which is basically aggregated time series data we allow you to query the time series data and, and have this kind of active state cache so a lot wrapped up in all that, but basically, you know, if, if you want to build a DAP platform, uh, you know, any, sorry, any kind of DAP, we can help you with that. And our customers are across, you know, I mentioned Aave, so financial services, DeFi. Uh, we also have traditional financial companies that we're working with, um, automotive and manufacturing, blockchain-based games, infrastructure, logistics. What we, our approach is, uh, at least to date, because we're a fairly, you know, modest sized team, we're, we're looking to work with customers and partners that understand blockchain to a degree, have a need, and um, uh, where we can, we can have an impact and, and put them out front. So, you know, we're not, we're not sort of, uh, we're not going out there yet in, in a very broad sense. We're, we're, we're being, um, you know, a little bit more uh, focused with who and how we work with for now, because we think that's, that's more productive for, uh, for both of us. Yeah, I mean, some product market fit there and validation, right? Um, and I think those are like, and so sorry, you're you're, and you're only tapping into uh, Ethereum at the moment. Uh, so Ethereum and and Ethereum uh, compatible chains. Okay. Uh, we are we are adding support for uh, we are going to be adding support for some non-Ethereum uh, blockchains as well. 
the, the focus on Ethereum and, and near Ethereum, so, you know, OMG Network, or Mise Go and, and XDAI, Binance Smart Chain, is that honestly, like, that's where the transaction volume is. Yeah, you know, if, yeah. it, if you go look at the block explorers, that's where 99% of the transaction volume is. And of course, Bitcoin as well. But, but I think where, 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 where um, you know, Bitcoin primarily is a store of value, we're much more focused on building a, a DAP, a more complex DAP that involves smart contracts. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And I think, you know, that's great that you're kind of targeting the, the you know, the, the chains right now that are um, the most active yet. It seems like you guys are pretty flexible and nimble to adapt as the market evolves. Absolutely. Across yeah, I mean, chains. You, absolutely. You know, our, our, I mean, even the naming of our product, multi-bass, multi-blockchain as a service, right? We, we I mean, I, I we strongly believe, I mean, I, I personally believe in our corporate philosophy is that there is going to be a plethora of blockchains, uh, you know, maybe not as many as we have today. There, I think we'll see some consolidation, but uh, there's going to be many blockchains out there, just as there are many databases or many operating systems. You know, some of them have wide adoption. Some of them are a little bit more niche. You know, the yeah. operating system running in your air conditioner, for example, it does a great job of that and is probably installed in millions of air conditioners globally. Um, and there's a place for that, just as there's a place for, you know, Android or Mac OS or Windows or Linux or whatever, right? And I think it's going to be the same with blockchain platforms. So, you know, we, we, when, it, when it comes to, you know, I mean, if you're a, blo- if you're a blockchain pl- platform or protocol and you, you, you know, you want, uh, you're looking for, for a partner that can help you reach more customers, uh, you know, take away some of the, the challenges that, of people building on your platform or just, you know, making it easier, We'd love to talk to you and love to love to integrate. And as I said, we're looking at some, you know, we're, we're working on some non-Ethereum uh, integrations at the moment that hopefully I can share more about in the coming, the coming weeks. Awesome. Awesome. Now we're looking forward to that. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll be on the lookout for that. So we've kind of just touched on kind of y- your journey into blockchain. We've just touched on curve grid and like what you guys are focused on, what you guys are, are excelling at. Um, and, and it's pretty critical, like I said, to adoption to uh, you know, efficiently like developing things with non-blockchain developers or blockchain, um, you know, developers, vice versa, doesn't really matter. Um, and we need that. We need these solutions out there to, you know, obviously you come um, w- with a strong background and you obviously saw it like years ago. Um, and we thought of this too, like there's so many p- people like fatiguing and kind of trying to build things over and over. And it's just, it's just kind of tough. So you're out here trying to help us. So the theme of the theme of this conference is NFTs. Um, you know, we did we did um, DeFi kind of when, when, uh, last August, um, and we've kind of just had one every month, a different a different topic, different theme. And so, what are you guys working on in the NFT space? I know you're launching like a cross platform bridge. Um, I'll kind of maybe let you touch on that on on what that looks like. Um, but before we get into that, what do you think about NFTs? Right, they're kind of booming. Uh, there's so many avenues and I'll kind of let you pick in terms of like your, your insights or your perspective on like, is this, you know, um, residual income for like artists? Is this like, you know, real estate? How do you see NFTs kind of in the space moving Mm -hmm. forward? I, I, I think, I think NFTs are here to stay. And I think where we are right now in the NFT hype cycle, if you will, is, we, we are in, it's like we're in 2017 and it's, it's ICO boom time again, uh, where this is like wave one. And, you know, the, you know, the, the hype, the hype, it's, a, it's a hype cycles are hype cycles, right? We'll, we'll see a down, a down cycle. People will lose interest, et cetera, et cetera. And then it's going to come back at some point in the near, near future, not, not, not years, but year, year two and, and uh, even even uh, even bigger, right? And so we're gonna go from the ICO version of NFTs that we have now to the DeFi version, which is gonna be the next, the next iteration, you know, I, and, and, and that's my, that's my, my personal uh, theory on that. Um, I mean, we've been interested in them for, for a long time. You know, you, you talk about our original project, the warehouse management system, I mean, that's basically an NFT you're representing, you know, maybe not a t-shirt, but something with a serial number, like, I don't know, uh, a, a car engine or something like that, you know, a, 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 a watch, a luxury watch, uh, that's an NFT. And, and we, we've, you know, we've certainly been watching the space. It's all timing is always hard timing the, the, the hype timing, the market. So, you know, we didn't see this coming. I think we yeah, got yeah. swept up in it as much as everybody else, but um, um, we've been thinking about it 
for a very long time, we've got really um, uh, two, you know, two kind of, uh, well, I guess three, three parts to, to how, we're, how we're approaching NFTs. The first, as you mentioned, Adam, is uh, our uh, cross-chain digital asset bridge looking glass, um, which is in early access mode at this point. And there's a lot of different cross-chain. So, so what is a cross-chain bridge? Let me take a step back. Like, why is this important for NFTs? Uh, because it's it's a little bit more advanced from where most products projects are today. A lot of a lot of NFT products are like, I want to mint an NFT and I want to sell it on a marketplace, right? And there's some great solutions out there for that. Um, the the opportunity and the challenge that we're seeing is that there's blockchains with very high liquidity uh, in terms of of, of uh, uh, let's say their marketplaces market opportunities, but also very high fees. Ethereum mainnet, right? Like you've got OpenSea and Foundation and Rarible and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the, the great marketplaces on there. But you know, you want to mint and sell an NFT, you're looking at like, I don't know, two hundred dollars in transaction fees all in. So the value of your NFT has to be about that. And that's that's fine. But like, you know, I mean, uh, if you're a if you're a blockchain based game or you're selling or giving away collectibles, you're you're a music musical artist that's giving away, you know, collectibles or want to sell, you know, uh, uh, like collectibles to your fans at something less than a few hundred dollars. It just, it doesn't make sense in absolute terms. And so you might want to launch on a different blockchain, let's say a Binance Smart Chain or an XDAI or, you know, OMG Network or something like that, where there's, you know, or, or Matic, right, Polygon, where there's, there's much lower transaction fees, but also much lower liquidity. And eventually you may want to, to bridge back to other blockchains. Um, now there are ERC-20 bridges, right? which basically bridge means that, uh, you know, there's, there's one leg on one blockchain and another leg on another blockchain. And it basically does the transfer between the two blockchains. Our bridge is, is very much focused on NFTs and making it easy for developers to integrate directly into their blockchain based game or into their DAP. So, you know, you're building, let's say, how's that different? Know, how's that, di how's that different? Uh, don't mean to interrupt, but like, no, no, please. Uh, yeah, the interoperability part, and your focus on NFTs, right? Which is a cross bridge, you know, yeah. uh, NFT platform here. Like, how does that different um, at a high level to to some other bridge that's focused on some other type of um, interoperability? Yeah, is it yeah, standard? There's, there's, like, is it standards? Is it uh, you know yeah. the, the setup? Yeah, yeah, yeah. At, at its at its core, uh, the first yeah the first challenge is standards, right? So the ERC twenty standard non you know, fungible tokens. It's a very, very simple standard. Uh, you know, you've, you've only got like a few kind of pieces to connect together, right? Transfer and balance and, and things like that. Uh, NFTs are much more complicated because um, you, you really care about the provenance, the history of each item. And so the, the, um, uh, the, the standard or the interface is a little bit more complex. The, the two ones that are, you know, we're probably all most familiar with are ERC-721, the base non-fungible token standard and ERC-1155, which is sort of a standard for uh, batching together, not only non-fungible tokens, but also fungible tokens. And um, ERC-721 is actually, you know, relatively straightforward. ERC-725 is, or 1155 is a lot more uh, complicated, let's say. So that's, that's the first thing, the complexity of the standards. The second challenge, right, and the difference between, uh, you know, let's say just, just non-fungible tokens is, um, often for non-fungible tokens, the bridge involves uh, individual users moving their tokens between blockchains. Whereas with NFTs, our thesis is that uh, you will not want to have your users having to, it's about user experience. You know, if you're a DeFi user, an investor, and you care about bridging between blockchains, you're happy to go to a website or you write a bot or write some script to do the, the bridging for you excuse me, in the NFT space, if it's a blockchain based game, let's say, you don't want your users to, all right, let me pause my gameplay and I'm gonna take my bushel of wheat and my 26 gold coins. I'm gonna go to a website, you know, type a bunch of stuff in, MetaMask transaction approve, like, you know, forget that, right? That completely destroys the kind of user experience. And so, you know, our, our thesis there is that we'll, we'll take all of these complex interactions wrap them up in an easy to use REST API, much as you have with Multibass, and then um, uh, allow you to integrate that directly into your blockchain-based game or your VR experience like we're doing with, with Division or your 
um, uh, you know, your art marketplace or your musical art marketplace. So, so yeah, that's, that's, that's the kind of key piece there. And, and what does it look like in terms of platform and then games? So we're interoperable or composability interoperable between like network to network and also uh, like uh Internetwork, right? So, or, or like you know, cross chain, and then also like internetwork. Like, how, how does that work in terms of the same games on the same platform versus these games? You know, switching over to these games on this network, almost like a, I don't know, P- PlayStation and and you know, Xbox or yeah. something along those lines. Yeah, how does that even look? And I don't even know if we're there yet. What are the tools and and, and how? I guess obviously that's like a challenge and a barrier that that you're solving. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Great analogy. Right. And, and it's interesting because I think, you know, um, uh, you, you, may, you have like exclusive titles on Xbox or PlayStation or, or whatever, or, you know, PC, and then you've got ones that launch on kind of every platform. And I, I think generally, uh, you know, th- that, that there's going to be, I think m- many blockchain based games are going to want to launch on multiple platforms. This is actually kind of another piece, which is, you know, not just for liquidity of buying and selling items, but also where the players are. Like, okay, well, I don't know, all of my friends and all my wallets are working on this blockchain. So, you know, I want to be on that blockchain, Um, you know, or from from an item perspective, like, okay, you know, we've got gold or bushels of wheat or whatever, but I've got, you know, the sword of Democles that's like a $5,000 item. Like, nobody's going to want to buy that on here. I think I can get a better price for it or, you know, on this other blockchain. So I'm going to take it over there. Um, is is kind of the the um, yeah the thinking um, the other the other thing that you're asking about is um, uh, just in terms of like what does that even look like bridging across blockchains? It's one of those things that seems deceptively simple at yeah. the beginning, but starts to get really really complex when you consider that the whole value of the blockchain is the 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 sanctity and security of the consensus layer, right where you know, we all trust in proof of work, we all trust in proof of stake, or we all trust in proof of authority, right? Pick your consensus model for whatever your blockchain or your, your DLT is. Um, but when you want to connect two blockchains together, each of them individually is very, very secure. But if you want to go between them, you're now essentially breaking that, that sanctity, and you have to have a trusted middle party to essentially, you know, bridge the two of them. Right. And, and there was an interesting article uh, recently I was reading about like the, the Bitcoin to it, like the wrapped Bitcoin bridge. Yeah, you, know, you can yeah, wrap yeah. Bitcoin on Ethereum. Like who's operating that? <laughs> right. Who's who's. And, and I, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's not trustworthy, but just yes. stop to think about that for a second. For you're sure. sending your Bitcoin to an address on the Bitcoin network and you're getting wrapped Bitcoin ERC20 token on the Ethereum network. If you want to go the other way, it's the opposite. Right. But on both sides of that the 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 entity or entities that are essentially operating that bridge have complete control of any of the assets that are locked into that bridge and it's the same thing with non-fungible token items or or fungible tokens right so um you know a lot of the complexity of operating and running a bridge is around how do we make sure that people don't lose their items or people like, uh, you know, how, how do, how do we ensure that we're picking the, the, the right level of security when we're managing uh, uh, like how the, how, how the items, how the NFTs, how the tokens are, are locked up. And, and that's the other thing that, um, that, that we're, we're spending a lot of time on. It's one of these problems that seems deceptively simple, but ends up being very, very complex. And I, I think, um, you know, knock wood, uh, everything, you know, has been pretty, pretty okay so far, but just like we've seen hacks on exchanges on DeFi platform, you know, protocols, et cetera, et cetera. I think at some point we're going to see a, a bridge fall apart as yeah. well. And, um, um, you know, so, so, you know, we, that, that's something that's very much in our minds as well as we're, we're bringing these, these solutions to market is like making it as secure and robust as possible. And so I see two kind of, uh, barriers here, or at least kind of things that we need to look at in terms of NFTs and uh, love to get your thoughts. Like there's a technical aspect that you guys are working on. And then on the flip side, it's kind of a social thing, but really the demand side, like wh- where do you see NFTs taking off in terms of gaming, the art world? Um, this is kind of what's at, what we see at the moment. Um, yeah. 
and you know, I'm always curious to know, like, is the demand, you know, is the value going to come from like the demand, meaning like the end user, like I want these, or, you know, is it coming from the, the sellers, right? Like I have mm-hmm. art now I'm going to like create this NFT. I hope I have buyers. Where do you kind of see NFTs falling uh, are going to continue to boom in like what verticals? It might be a few verticals, but like, where, where do you, where are you keeping your eye on? You know, this is the this is the like billion dollar question, right? If I knew the answer to this, right? If this, if I had an answer, not just an opinion, you know, I would, uh, I don't know, um, uh, yeah, exactly, right? But um, but that's fine, right? But but it's it's fun to kind of speculate. So I will speculate because it's pure speculation, you know. I, I and and just broader broader thinking first, like blockchain and NFTs, it's a technology, right? It's a platform to build on, and. Uh, you know, when you start to look at it like that and, and you, you, you don't think of it as like almost a, a like religious or cultural movement, but you think of it as a technology or platform first, like it's here to stay, yeah. right? It, yeah. it just, the, 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 the cost, the low cost, the high speed, the trustless nature, the, which means like fewer middlemen in between means that you would be crazy not to build on it. You'd be crazy not, you know, in, in, yeah. on, on some time frame, right? Like, whatever your industry is, you know, maybe it's not a year or five years or 10 years, maybe it's more than that, that it's going to take your industry to move to that. But eventually, as a technology, this will supplant kind of everything that we have today across many, many different fields, as diverse as logistics, tracking a container around the world or real estate, right? Like, who owns a particular piece of land, who gets paid, who who has the insurance contract, you know, etc, etc. And of course, gaming and art, and collectibles, and um, you know, I, I don't like the 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 uh, art and collectible space that, that uh, globally. We're looking at this recently. It's something like a three hundred seventy billion dollar market. Three hundred seventy billion dollars. That's a. I mean, for collect. I mean, everything from baseball cards to classic cars to artwork. Right. That's a massive, massive market. And um, I think that eventually you're going to see everything. I mean physical certificates of prominence of art, it's all going to move to the blockchain. Um, you know, the the ownership of collectibles, trading cards, it's all going to move to the blockchain. I think everything over time is going to move to the blockchain. It's a question of uh, what comes first and in what form. And to your, to your question or your point, Adam, is it demand or supply side driven? And I don't have an answer to that. I think that um, just like nobody, well, okay, some people saw NBA top shot coming, but I think it's going to be in surprising areas like that, where there's going to be, it's going to take off yeah. and drive a lot of the demand in, in, in other areas. Like, you know, we have, so, so linking it to DeFi, right. We have AMMs, automated market makers today, like a, a Uniswap or Sushi Swap, uh, more compound, I guess, um, uh, you know, that, that are really the evolution from decentralized exchanges or DEXs. Uh, due to, you know, to work around issues like high gas costs uh, from a couple of years ago. And I think it's the same thing in the NFT space where we've got, you know, we had CryptoKitties and we have CryptoKitties and CryptoPunks and, and uh, artwork and marketplaces like Zora or, or you know, OpenSea, et cetera, et cetera. The question is like, what's the next evolution of that going to look like? And I, I think that some of those projects are being seeded today um but of the 100 projects that are out there which are the two or three that are really going to take off and i don't think anybody knows yet yeah no i mean and, and you talk about like i think there i forget the number but it's close to around like 25 percent of you know these wealthy billionaires like keep their their wealth in art and i feel mm-hmm. like that's the next disruptor uh well it hasn't really been disrupted right we kind of you know, curate art and, and kind of have these, you know, these storefronts. Um, and that's pretty much it. And, and I think this NFT um, is going to drive some value to some of the other, you know, artists in the world that mm-hmm. can have these redig- residual, you know, payouts, right? Like mm-hmm. in the end, they're the ones that kind of get lost in the shuffle once that art goes, you know, secondary markets and all that, like, that's it, you know, you kind of, Mm-hmm. kind of lose you lose um you know some skin in the game there but no you bring up some like super interesting you know concepts there and yeah i don't know what's going to happen because because we're i'm on the you know we're on the tech side like i see 
Mm-hmm. It, like you said, it's a platform. It's something to build on. There, there, there's obviously value there. There's, you know, all kinds of things being sold already. And then I'm just kind of thinking, I don't kind of value certain things. So I'm just trying mm-hmm. to figure out where the value is or, or where is it being transferred from? Is it the artists like that want to push this? Is it the demand side? And I just think it's going to be native. Obviously, it's going to be native to generations. And like, as we move forward, it's mm-hmm. just going to, mm-hmm. everything's mm-hmm. going to be on chain. Yeah, you know, I, I think the big challenge, the, the biggest challenge for blockchain still is usability. Yeah. Right. Yeah. UX. Right. Yeah. And and you know, as soon as soon as as soon as something requires MetaMask, you know, you're you're limiting the or any other web three wallet, yeah. right? You're limiting the scope of people that can realistically get involved in it uh, to a much smaller group of people. So I think, you know, I'll talk about two of our partners that we've announced. One is a uh, uh, Tricera. Uh, which is a, a traditional art marketplace that has something like 2,400 artists from 80 countries um, and 18,000 pieces of physical art for sale, oil paintings, watercolor, statues, right? And, and um, you know, they've, they've been interested in NFTs for quite a long time. And now we're working with them to essentially launch digital art as NFTs on their platform. And the value that they have provided and do provide is... Um, you know, for physical art, acting is kind of the middle, the middle layer, the, almost like a traditional art, art broker, art gallery would to, you know, we'll handle the shipping, the packaging, the insurance, the payment, you know, uh, for the artists. So they don't, they can focus on their art. They don't need yeah. to worry about that. The marketing as well. And then finding and connecting with the buyers. So I mentioned 80 countries, 2,400 artists on the buying side, it's, it's buyers from, you know, North America, Europe, Asia, you know, and, and of course, everywhere around the globe. But, you know, if you're a, a Nigerian artist, uh, you know, doing oil paintings, like how are you, you know, there, there's a lot of things that you might need to do to try and connect with buyers in like Europe, for example. And so, you know, Tricera does that for traditional artists. They're going to do that for NFTs as well. And I think bring some curation and legitimacy to it and help their, their existing artists that want to get into NFTs on that journey. Right. And, um, you know, there's there's um, so that's one way, like more because you mentioned us as software engineers, there, there's a whole user experience aspect to that there of helping to guide people and onboard them that I think is going to be really, really important in the NFT space. And so, you know, we're excited to be basically they're going to be adding NFTs into their their art marketplace and, and um, you know, building on our multibus platform to do that. The other one is uh, Zyko. Uh, which is a, a um, uh, like virtual concert platform. They do, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, and, and especially relevant in these, these socially distanced stay at home times where people are attending concerts from their favorite bands or music, musical artists uh, remotely, um, you know, basically allowing uh, uh, musicians to give out, you know, like digital collectibles, yeah. virtual collectibles, their fans that have the backing of the blockchain. So it's not just like, oh, I'll email you a, a JPEG or something like that, but no, it's like, you know, it's a video or a moment or something that's personalized. It's got provenance. And um, uh, yeah, you know, that, that's another experience where, where uh, you don't necessarily want everybody, like you, you, you wouldn't expect everyone to go set up a, you know, step one, download MetaMask, right? Like that's, you know, so, so they're looking at it and we're helping them with a much more web 2.0 experience that's completely backed by the blockchain. And I think in NFTs, we're going to see a lot more in that direction, right? And whether it's it's kind of, you know, custodial for now or, you know, uh, and, and really if you look at like NBA Top Shots, that's the model they've taken, 100% custodial, even though it's backed by the blockchain. I think there's nothing wrong with that approach. Um, and we got to start somewhere. We got more of that. Yeah, I mean, exactly. We got we to start somewhere and kind of going back to the beginning of, of, building out the infrastructure, like the education, how these things operate, you know, the objectives, the goals, like what people are looking for um, and, and understanding where the value lies for whoever's launching an NFT, if it makes sense or not, because these are new business models. And I think, like you said, you know, they're going to definitely pop up in different areas, whether you're an influencer, you know, whether it's like, you know, I don't know, selling, you know, school books, right. And kind of, yeah. you know, earning money that way from, from publishers or, you know, kind of going that enterprise route. Um, and I mean, Nike's done their own, you know, NFT uh, Kings of Leon here, like their album, the mm-hmm. group disclosure mm-hmm. just sold like their, their, their logo face to Delphi digital actually like for whatever X amount of money. Um, so no, yeah, it's kind of an interesting landscape. And so 
in the grand scheme of things, and, you know, we're going to wrap it up here. What ending are we in in this game? Like, we're still inning one, and we kind of got a long ways to go. Obviously, we're moving at rapid speeds. I mean, we you know, we could probably go on for days on identity, IoT devices, mm-hmm. right, that are tapping mm-hmm. into the, this blockchain technology on, on data transfer and all that. What, yeah, um, yeah well, where do you kind of see, you know, we're 2021 now. What, what's your kind of vision for the next few years at a high level, like at its core? Yeah. Obviously, we're excelling um, and we're in a pace of innovation, right? DeFi's taking off. Like, here we are in NFTs and, and you know, I'm sure there's going to be a bunch of new use cases. But where do you kind of see the next, um, you know, again, what, what inning are we in and are we still at the beginning stages? Yeah, yeah. So, so to, to use your baseball analogy, we're still in spring training. Oh, we're the wow. Toronto Blue Jays down in Dunedin, Florida in spring training, you know, Munahiro Kawasaki's there, you know, hanging out at the side. And I mean, it's like, it's that's, um, that's where we are. We're in spring training. We're that wow. early days. So, so I'll give you, you know, you mentioned some, some other ideas there. I'll give you another vision that I think is, is kind of interesting. What happens if every single picture that you take on your, your smartphone becomes an NFT, gets an NFT attached to it and it gets uploaded to the cloud and it's an NFT and it's not necessarily an NFT that is accessible to anybody on the public blockchain, but you can share it with your friends and family. And yeah. it's got that provenance. So, you know, you're looking through a, a photo album, uh, you know, years and years. I mean, your yeah. descendants are looking through a photo album, your yeah. great, great grandchildren. They go, oh yeah, this was indeed taken by this person. Or, you know, some of your your photos that you take are, are um, you know, you could gift it to your significant other, right? You could give it to your friends. You can share it within your circle of friends. You could, you could, uh, you know, some of the, the photos that you take maybe, maybe are worth it. You want to sell them and you can and everything like what, if, what if it was integrated into Google photos or Apple, yeah. Apple photos, right? Like that's, I think that's where we're going with it. I think that it's going to become just a part of all of the digital and, and even physical things that we produce it's going to have an NFT attached to it. Uh, I mean, I think that's that's where we could go with this. What about storage, though? Were we ever going to run out of storage for all this stuff? Um, well, you know, like maybe, right? But yeah. probably not, right? I mean, you know, you look at the amount of, of new information that's being produced today, you know, photos, audio, videos, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, we've all got lots of cloud storage available. So I don't, I don't think that's really necessarily an NFT issue. I think that's more of a just general data issue yeah. and things will get lost. Things will disappear, yeah, but that happens yeah. anyway, right? Yeah, Museum, yeah. unfortunately it burns down or has a fire or something gets stolen or thrown out or, you know, I don't think that's an NFT problem. I think that's just a general like data problem. Yeah. Um, but, but and yeah. I guess, and I guess that, and I guess that's what I meant too. Like in general, not not specific to NFT, but just yeah, yeah. all of this storage, even on chain transactions. I guess you know it'll it'll hash itself out. Um, where, where can people learn more about um, Curve Grid and what you guys are doing? Stay up to date, get insights. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you know, come check us out, CurveGrid.com. If you are a builder uh, or you're a protocol or platform that um, you know is looking to expand your reach. Uh, if you're a protocol or platform, connect with more developers. If you're a developer or a business that's looking to accelerate your uh, journey onto blockchain, reduce your, your time to market, we'd love to talk. Um, you know, you can you can certainly reach out via our website. And um, uh, yeah, we'd, we'd love to be in touch. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Jeff, uh, thanks for uh, participating. Thanks for speaking. We touched on, on a wide range of things, kind of your journey, what Curve Grid is, NFT, you know, the NFT space right now, the boom, and um, and appreciate, you know, kind of you sharing your thoughts here. Uh, again, we have a lot of students tuning in. We have a lot of, of our communities tuning in from our partners. You know, I'm sure you're going to share this as well. So um, I think it's good information, good knowledge, and it kind of ties back into the education of like, this is some real shit. Like we're building some cool stuff. Um, you guys are, you know, making an impact. Um, it's not just Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, right? It's, it's a lot more than that. It's fundamental. It's going imp- to, we're not, I'm not saying crypto and blockchain is going to like save the world, but, uh, it's going to make an impact whether you like it or not one way or Absolutely. another in some shape, yeah. you know, some shape or form. So yeah, again, thanks for, thanks for coming to visit us. Um, everybody, this is Jeff Wentworth, CEO of Curve Grid. Thank you all for tuning in to reimagine 2021. Um, And uh, we hope you enjoyed the talk today and we'll see you guys soon. Thanks, Jeff. Have a good one.
Thank you, Adam. Bye.